So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando Resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus enter by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. Welcome to Breezeline, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile, because we have 99.9% network reliability, and they don't. That's right. Time, weather, or even streaming in a basement won't affect our superior service. That's because we have real internet, backed by our fiber-powered network. And T-Mobile? Well, they just have a 5G cellular network. So for a limited time, find your perfect speed with prices starting at $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to Breezeline.com to learn more. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you're listening to Revive Thoughts. I saw I had to insist on this important subject because within the space of only five weeks, there had been five self-murders. The Lord knows how many others may be tempted at this time to do the same. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they deliver today. We're going back to colonial America in the year 1672 in Boston. We're going to listen to a sermon by Increase Mather. Mather is a familiar name. Increase, maybe not so much, huh? Yeah, Increase is not a common name. In fact, I don't know if there are too many other famous increases in history. It's spelled uh, just like how you think it's spelled. Yeah, inc- like the word Increase. Actually, and this is not even in the comments, but I read that his mom had basically kind of a nice thought about it. Like, I hope his name will increase the name of God in the country or something to that effect. Aww. And that's why she named him Increase. That's, that's a sweet. That's, that's kind of cool. I kind of like A it. nice name for him. Now, Joel, I was going to tell you, we have a YouTube comment. We don't normally read these, but we try to encourage you. If you are a listener, shout us out on Twitter. Shout us out on YouTube. Shout us out on wherever you're kind of at. Leave us an Apple Podcast review. So I want to read this YouTube comment that came in this week, which says, I just discovered this podcast last week, and I love it. To hear these sermons is inspiring, and especially to hear from men I have never known is equally good. I also benefit greatly from the church history insights that you provide with each episode. I have told my son, husband, and father about this show and encouraged them to also seek it out. Thank you for the time and effort you have put into these podcasts. Thank you for leaving the comment on our show. We really appreciate any kind of feedback that can help people. So if you're out there, you're wondering, should I say something? Please do. Other people will see it. And it will help to grow the podcast and the the whole network. And so we're very appreciative when people leave things like that for us. Now, this episode was not easy to create. I want to be upfront and very um, disclaimer this episode. This sermon by Increase Mather, Do Yourself No Harm, is a sermon on the topic of suicide. And you may have strong feelings. You may have reasons that this might not be a great episode for you to listen to. I want to encourage you that if you need to step away, this is not a good episode for you. Uh, don't let that discolor you. That there's nothing wrong with that. No one's gonna, you know, think less of you for hitting the pause button and moving on. That's okay. In this episode, we also want to leave the disclaimer that we're not going to tell you that we agree with everything Increase Mather maybe says in this sermon exactly as he says it. He wrote this and preached this sermon 400 years ago. And yet, I think the sermon is so important. In all my time of working on Revived Thoughts, this is the first sermon I have found on this subject. And when I found it, I realized I really don't see this subject talked about very often in church. Uh, Maybe you can think of times your pastor has preached on it or made it an important part of their message. But I can't think of too many times that I've been in a church where this topic even really comes up for more than maybe just a, you know, line or two here and there. Increase Mather is coming right at it and saying, here are my thoughts. You may not agree with him. You may not agree with that approach, but he is talking about it. And I think a lot of people do not talk about it at all. And yet the church has thoughts, has answers. And there are probably people, you may not know that, but there might be some people in your life who are struggling with this. And I think the church needs to be the place where we go to for answers. I think oftentimes we're afraid to approach this subject because we're worried that we'll say something wrong. 
And so out of a fear of not offending that somebody or stepping on someone's toes or hurting someone who's lost a loved one to suicide or, you know, in some way doing it the wrong way, we just choose not to talk about it at all. And I don't think that is the best approach. I think as the church, it's good to talk about these really hard subjects. And so when we find a sermon like this, know that we're not saying we completely endorse every aspect of it. But on the flip side, we're also saying we should try to talk about this and it should be something that the church has answers to. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good disclaimer. And I also think it's important to kind of keep in context that Increase Mather is preaching this to a congregation in, during a sermon. It's not a one-on-one conversation. I feel like if, if you're talking to someone one-on-one, it would be a very different approach and and you know, it would take a very different tact than you would if you're speaking to a larger group more broadly in a lecture type setting. Um, that being said, I still I still don't think Troy and I would, again, maybe take the same approach that Increase Mather is doing in this sermon. But uh, I think his point, that Troy's point of the fact that it is something that we need to, to talk about and be open with, uh, make sure is not ignored in the church, uh, is an important one. Let me set up the backstory. Increase Mather here. Uh, and Mather might sound familiar to you. That's probably because of his brother, Cotton Mather who got his uh, his name down in history with his involvement with the Salem Witch Trials. That's where Calvin Mather, he's probably most famously known for around the Salem Witch Trials. I reckon he would probably still be remembered as a, a great speaker, even if he was not involved with the Salem Witch Trials as well. He has um, a pretty good list of, of sermons and his involvement with early colonial America. And this I is, actually think in yeah. some ways uh, he would be even more famous and hmm. we would appreciate him a lot more today. I think the Salem Witch Trials is such a black eye on him. We miss out on a lot of really good stuff about them. Yeah, interest, interesting to think about. Uh, 1639 is when Increase Mather was born. And these are early Puritans, right? They came from New England uh, to the new country of, of these uh, colonial Americas uh, as, as Puritans for religious freedom, religious expression. They wanted to come and practice their faith here. Just to give you a, an idea of how important faith was to their family, not only did they you know, leave New England to settle in colonial America, but Increase, his name is actually the Hebrew transliteration of Joseph. All six of uh, his siblings were named after people in the Bible. Three of them would grow up to be ministers. He graduated from Harvard when he was 17 years old, and however, when he graduated, he gave this speech at his graduation of how he thought Aristotle was wrong about a lot of his stuff, and it got him in trouble. He almost It almost cost him his degree. So it was apparent very early on that he was passionate about the things, even, even if he was maybe confused about uh, some of the stuff. On his 18th birthday, he preached his first sermon, and afterwards he went to Ireland to study at, at a different school there. And at this school, he graduated with his master's. And during the graduation, he refused to wear a cap and gown because he thought it was a form of pride to dress that way. Again, interesting thoughts. It actually impressed the faculty. And the faculty actually it seems to have given him more respect because of it. Or at least they respect him for holding to his personal convictions, that type of thing. He stayed in Europe for a few years, but when Cromwell was replaced by Charles II, he returned to the colonies, fearing he'd be in trouble. He became a political and spiritual leader in the new colonies. Now, the colonies were small, but by the year 1700, there were about 260,000 people living there. So it's becoming a larger group of people, and Increase is seen as this very influential figure during this time as the country is starting to spread out. Uh, during a war between the Native Americans and the English that happened uh, called King Philip's War, Increase wrote one of the best eyewitness accounts we have. He mentioned when New England soldiers would get defeated. He, he kind of talked about the tactics they used. He even mentioned the kind of brutal stuff like when they killed children and women and wouldn't take prisoners. He puts all this in there, which gives us a lot of information about this war. But kind of an example of who he is and showing you the way he views the world. He also saw this whole war as New England's own fault. You may be saying, oh, did... New England backstab the Native Americans? Did they steal a treaty? Did they? No, no, nothing like that. Uh, he, he believed that if they'd been spreading Christianity and Christian love more properly, this wouldn't have happened. If they had not dressed themselves pridefully and braided their hair as much, then they wouldn't have been living so much in sin. Uh, he believed it was because they were in sin that God allowed the Native Americans to come and harass them. 
Uh, he also wrote a book on supernatural occurrences that became widely read and popular called Remarkable Providences. And in that book, uh, witchcraft is one of the big things that he sees as a supernatural instance that people need to uh, take seriously. And this will obviously play an effect on the Salem witch trials later on. Now, before you get thinking, okay, so increase is kind of crazy, uh, he had quoted contemporaries and he quoted other people and other reformers, men like Martin Luther and Melanchthon, who we all look up to as people who agree with him on this. And if you go look, it's true. They do have these uh, remarks on witchcraft and how it's something we should take seriously. So increase, if you do see him as you know crazy for these beliefs, he's not alone. It was actually quite popular during that time. It was a concurrent worldview that witchcraft needed to be taken seriously. And he was trying to get the people to walk and take these things seriously. Now, again, this definitely leads to the Salem Witch Trials. But if you want to learn about the Salem Witch Trials, you need to go to Revive Thoughts Patreon and go sign up and listen to the deep dive. Me and Joel did an entire hour and a half where we just really dig into what happened in the Salem Witch Trials. And I personally think it is a fantastic deep dive that you should absolutely go check out. It gives a really well-balanced approach uh, from a Christian perspective. We believe in demons. We believe they're real things. So could that have been playing the effect? And we really weigh out all the different answers. So go check that out. Yeah, it's a fun conversation. Uh, it Increase became the acting president of Harvard for about 20 years, and he helped ground it uh, in scholarship. He received Harvard's first doctrinal degree, and it was the only one given for the next 79 years. In the late 1600s, there were a lot of politics happening in England, one of which was James II becoming uh, the ruler of the area. We actually just recorded another deep dive about the Great London Fire, and uh, James II is a prominent factor in there. So keep an eye out for that coming out in the future. One of the things that James II tried to do was turn the colonies into what he called Dominion of New England. And this was basically proposing that uh, the old colony charters would go away, like Massachusetts and Delaware, and it would be kind of a, a one man enforcing the rule over everything. You know, it's been it's your king stuff. He wanted to rule everything uh, and didn't want these colonies to have their own charters and own sets of rules. So King James II appoints a governor, Edmund Andros, uh, to be in charge of this process and outlaw town meetings. He told clergies they could no longer marry. Uh, he took over Puritan churches and used them as Anglican churches. And Increase wrote uh, all about this and how unlawful it was. So Increase went to London where he was attempting to meet with leaders of England and talk about this situation. While he was there, he actually spies attempted to kidnap him and bring him to the king, but he was able to uh, avoid that and escape that. And he was actually successful in freeing them over the rule of this governor that the king had appointed to free the areas from this governor's rule. And this went well for a time. However, the new rules and new governor that Mather kind of helped put into place ended up not being very good, especially the governor people like didn't really like who, the kind of system that got replaced in Massachusetts. And this brought his popularity down quite a bit. The Salem Witch Trials also happened around the same time. And so his stock went down uh, pretty dramatically there. Uh, some other things about him, he was very strict, as we kind of mentioned before, and he had a lot of thoughts on how people should live their lives. Uh, he believed things like weather, bad harvest, a war, anything could be a sign from God of his disfavor in your life towards your attitude. And that also leads kind of to the idea that if bad things are happening to you, it's because you're doing something wrong. It's easy to judge this attitude as wrong and stupid and or, you know, whatever you want to say about it. But uh, it, it it's different if you maybe were raised in the colonies you're literally on the edge of the frontier you know there are wolves there are bears winters all these kind of things are really harsh and you're being raised by very sincere christians and those they, they move there because of their faith and so this is going to affect your worldview you're really going to see the providence of god in every single thing uh, but this also made him pretty strict Towards the end of his life, he will get into a public dispute with Solomon Stoddard, the grandfather of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he didn't like how the second generation of Puritans he saw were kind of becoming soft on things. Uh, and, and to a tiny degree, you know, he is a little bit correct because obviously the Great Awakening will happen through Jonathan Edwards. And how can you have a Great Awakening if things don't kind of fall asleep? But the, the reverse of that is also true. Uh, part of the reason things got sleepy was because of, again, the Mathers' family role in the Salem Witch Trials. 
So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 US and DC. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. Welcome to BreezeLine, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile, because we have 99.9% network reliability, and they don't. That's right. Time, weather, or even streaming in a basement won't affect our superior service. That's because we have real internet, backed by our fiber-powered network. And T-Mobile? Well, they just have a 5G cellular network. So for a limited time, find your perfect speed with prices starting at $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to BreezeLine.com to learn more. So this sermon, as we mentioned, is on the subject of of suicide. It was a sermon that was found in his notebook, and it was published about 40 years after his death. He had written in his notebook that he thought often about preaching on this subject, but before he did so, he wanted to make sure he got the words just right. Early in his preaching career, uh, he saw several in his congregation take their own life. And ever since then, he had wanted to say something on the subject. He wanted to, to preach a sermon on it. And one day he was thinking about this again. He was having a walk in his garden and he explains what happens next. He says, this day, my former thought about preaching on the evil of self-murder returning upon me again, I looked up to God. And as I was lifting up my heart to him, I was strangely moved and melted. Tears gushed from my eyes and it seemed as if it were said to me, preach on the subject and you shall save bodies and souls from death. After he preached that sermon on a Sunday, he later found out that a man had gone to church that day with the very plan to take his own life that evening. But after hearing the sermon, uh, he changed his plans to not do so. So in the the very first instance of that sermon being preached, God used it uh, to save this man from taking his own life. And uh, who knows, maybe in maybe 400 years later, uh, God can use it in another person's life. Acts 16, verses 27 and 28. He would have killed himself, but Paul cried with a loud voice, Do yourself no harm. In the context, the evangelist gives an accounting concerning the imprisonment of Paul and Silas for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a most remarkable thing happened, which led to the conversion of the jailer who had dealt very cruelly with them. We have here the story of that strange conversion. It was brought to pass by means of a miraculous earthquake which happened at midnight. The jailer was stressed and overwhelmed as he had been woken up by a terrifying earthquake. While distressed in his mind, the devil took advantage to fall upon him with horrid temptations. Two things are noted in the words before us. First, there's the evil which the jailer was tempted to commit, that is, self-murder. He drew his sword and was ready to sheath it into his own wretched body. Secondly, it is noted what was the happy means of diverting him from this evil, which is the apostle speaking to him. He cried out with a loud voice, very earnestly, and it was time to be in earnest, for it was a matter of life and death. For he used the most effective argument that could be used to dissuade him from persisting in his attempt of self-murder. He convinced him that the temptation which hurried him on to do this barbarous and bloody action was an unnecessary fear. He was afraid the prisoners were gone, and then the leaders who committed them to prison would put him to death for letting them escape. So Paul says, We are all here. How the apostle knew that this was his temptation, this is not expressly declared to us. Probably the jailer uttered some words that this was his purpose. However, he was distressed with fear that had no real cause. And yet, this fear did, through the work of Satan, prevail so far that he was just upon the point of killing himself. Such is the trickery of Satan and his great power over the minds of men. When God will see fit to let him loose, Satan can with only imaginary fears bring a person to death by his own hands. 
This was the case with the jailer, and it would have worked out to the jailer's destruction if Paul had not cried out so earnestly to him. Let us look at some doctrine from this passage to understand. People distressed with temptation sometimes need to be earnestly cautioned against the sin of self-murder. There are two things to be now spoken to. First, what the distresses and temptation are that lead men to the sin of self-murder. And then, the reasons why those that are so tempted should be earnestly cautioned against this evil. Question 1. The distresses and temptations that often put men to the sin of self-murder. What are they? 1. Sometimes men are tempted to do this evil so that they may not fall into the hands of those that they think will put them to a miserable death. This was the temptation of the jailer now before us. According to the law among the Romans, if the jailer let his prisoner go, he was to suffer the same punishment which the prisoner should have undergone, which we saw happen earlier in Acts, Acts chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. When Peter escaped, the soldiers that were set for his keepers, Herod ordered them to be put to death. Sinful creatures think for themselves that if they live a while longer, they will be put to a more miserable death, and therefore it may be said of them, sin you chose over suffering. They will destroy themselves rather than stay for other men to do it. We have several instances of this in the sacred scriptures. Saul, bloody Saul, was one of them. He will die by his own hands rather than the Philistines. Ahithophel was another of them. He might well conclude, when his counsel was not listened to, that David would prevail, and then he must die for his treasons. What is it we read of Zimri, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 18, when he saw the city was taken, and he would fall into the hands of his enemies, he burnt the king's house over himself, and he died. Human history gives us many other instances. Among the rest, Hannibal poisoned himself so that he might not fall into the hands of his enemies. Demosthenes did the same. The wicked Jews blasphemously imagined that the Holy Son of God, the Blessed Jesus, would have killed himself for fear of falling into their hands. John chapter 8, verse 22. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? 2. The fear of disgrace in the world puts men to it. There was this also in the temptation of the jailer. He thought it a disgraceful thing to be put to death in a way of judicial proceeding and with public execution, and therefore. Sometimes a proud spirit would rather commit the greatest sin against God than undergo a little disgrace for men. This was the temptation of Abimelech to murder himself, or, which is the same, to desire another to kill him. Judges chapter 9 verse 54. Slay me that men may not say of me, a woman slew him. There have been some that, when they have committed foul and shameful sins, have, through fear of punishment and disgrace among men, destroyed themselves. To a proud spirit there is nothing so bitter as disgrace and infamy. When this temptation overcomes them, they'll choose death rather than such misery. And so also is it when men, for fear of lacking what they need, will desperately destroy themselves. They think it will be a disgraceful thing to be seen by others as lacking for their food and shelter, and so they may attempt self-murder so as not to be brought to begging for a morsel of bread and living like a beggar. Such temptation is too hard for them, and therefore they think to be eased of it by self-destruction. 3. Distress of conscience is another way which the devil does many times take occasion to tempt men into the sin of self-murder. Saul was in distress of conscience as well as otherwise distressed, and therein would have starved himself to death. See 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 15, 22, and 23. Judas is in distress of conscience, and then he flies to the gallows so that he may release his wretched soul. The burden of a guilty and a wounded conscience is intolerable. It is said, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 14, Who can bear it? Poor creatures, having such a wounded spirit and being under the strong delusions of Satan, often think to obtain some ease by ruining themselves, especially when inward and outward troubles meet together, as oftentimes they do. Miserable creatures are in danger of becoming guilty of this crime. Satan takes this advantage to tempt them into it. It seems as if Job were tempted this way, though he had the grace to resist and conquer the temptation. 
He was afflicted by physical distresses. At the same time, he thought God was his enemy. He felt the terrors of God in his soul. God suffered Satan to terrify him with frightful dreams. He was tempted here to choose the most shameful death rather than be in such misery. He says, Job chapter 7, verse 15, My soul chooses strangling and death rather than life, but the mercy of God preserved him from laying violent hands upon himself. Question 2. For what reasons should the tempted be earnestly cautioned against following through with the temptation? 1. With temptations to self-murder, Satan is in them. Such temptations are not from the holy and blessed God. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Job's wife tempted him to commit such a sin that would bring a quick death upon himself, curse God, and die. She was an instrument of Satan. It was the devil that put her to giving that cursed and bloody counsel to her husband. The devil would persuade men to think of getting out of affliction by sin. Yes, and to die sinning. And the last act which they do before they go out of the world should be to commit some great sin against the glorious God. He knows this will render them unfit to die. So the devil says, murder yourself and die. Stab yourself, shoot yourself, choke yourself, and die. The devil is therefore said to be, John chapter 8 verse 44, a murderer. Yes, Satan has a most peculiar hand in the perpetration of this crime, as is evident from the strange manner how sometimes it is accomplished, by drowning in a small puddle of water, hanging upon a small twig, not enough to bear the weight of a man, or with knees resting on the ground, still it has happened. Satan must have a great hand. The invisible world is most likely at work in such moments as these. 2. Self-murder is a very great sin. Murder is the greatest sin against the second table of the law. It is a great offense in the sight of God. Here is that expression in the scripture concerning a most wretched thing, Isaiah chapter 66 verse 3. It is as if he killed a man. It is a sin that cries to heaven for vengeance. See Acts chapter 28 verse 4. But self-murder is the worst kind of murder. It is the most unnatural. For a man to murder a near relative is worse than for him to murder a stranger. And the nearer the relation is, the greater the sin. So how unnatural is it that one would murder themselves? The self-murderer sins against the glorious God in defacing of his image and dishonoring of his name especially if he is a person that has made any pretensions of following God. He sins against himself, against his own body, as if hating his own flesh. And it may be said of him, you have sinned against your own soul. His reputation also is forever destroyed by this action. He sins against his relatives to whom he causes the greatest grief and the greatest dishonor that can be. 3. A willful and unrepentant self-murderer cannot be saved. We are taught, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in them. Then most certainly, no self-murderer without repentance, which, in many cases, how can it even occur if the self-murder is successful? It is true, the elect of God may be seriously tempted into this sin. The jailer was one of those. Yes, many of the elect have been tempted, perhaps in the pangs of the new birth or at their first conversion into God, and some have been tempted even long after their conversion. The best of saints upon earth may have been tempted this way. Of Job I have already mentioned it to you. I may tell you of Luther and of many more when the devil has no hope of prevailing, yet he will still tempt us into this crime. He will do it only to vex and accost the faithful servants of God. He even tempted our blessed Jesus himself to do it. See Matthew chapter 4 verse 6. But, except it is in case of destruction, it is a rare thing for Satan to prevail over any that belongs to God. If he does, yet the execution cannot be so accomplished as to leave no space of repentance. Therefore, it is noticed that though we read some of the elect of God in the scripture that have been tempted into this crime, yet none were left to actually commit it. In scripture, only the worst of sinners were successful in self-murder. These were Saul, Ahithophel, 
a Zimri, and a Judas, a Bimelech, and was there any other? 4. Life is a great mercy. Men should be cautioned against despising and willfully casting away the mercies of God. Life in this world is an invaluable mercy, because while there is life, there is hope. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 4. To him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. As long as persons are alive, there is the hopeful possibility that they may repent and turn and live for God, that they may obtain an assurance of a salvation in Jesus Christ, that the pardon of their sins may be secured. But when life is at an end, there is no hope of repentance or of getting a part in Christ or of getting sin to be forgiven. We are told, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, After death is the judgment. If those things are not made sure of before the soul of man is out of his body and his probation time is over, it will be too late forever. So we read Isaiah chapter 38, verse 18. They that go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. Application 1. We may here take notice of the folly and unreasonableness of those temptations by which sinful creatures are sometimes led into self-destruction. Most especially, the unreasonable fear of disgrace in the world. For any man to do himself harm for fear of that, this is a marvelous folly. A man cannot disgrace himself more than by committing such a sin as self-murder. He leaves an everlasting blot upon his name as long as he is remembered in this world. And there is, besides, an everlasting contempt which such persons, dying impenitently, must at the last day be exposed to. When besides all their other sins are found out, there will be this added against them too, that they were guilty of the most unnatural wickedness in the world. It is not foolish for men to bring upon themselves an eternal shame and confusion as they enter into the world without end, all to escape a temporary shame. So when men will do harm to themselves for the fear of lacking what they need, it is unspeakable folly and madness in the children of men to do it, because they do that act and throw themselves into that place where they lack every good thing forever. And Psalms chapter 49 verse 19, they will never see the light. In hell there is lack of everything. No spiritual blessings are there. No Sabbaths, nor any means of grace are there for you. No, nor any earthly comforts either. Not so much as a drop of water to relieve a tongue in torments there. There is another poor creature who is tempted by the devil. He says to himself, I am not elect, and I am sure I will not be saved, and therefore, if I destroy myself, I will have less punishment in hell than if I lived longer in the world. I answer them, You can't know you're not elect. It is not God, but Satan, who tells you that you are not elect. You are not sure that you will not be saved. The Lord says no such thing to you, but says, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, Look to me all the ends of the earth, and you will be saved. Whatever may happen to you, do yourself no harm. If you are really worried about hell, then better turn to Christ and be saved forever. For it is a lie that your damnation will be the less if you destroy yourself. For damnation and punishment in hell will be greater and the deeper according to the aggravations of the sins which have brought the sinner there. Now self-murder is a sin so heinous and aggravated that if you die unrepentantly under the guilt of it, your damnation will doubtless be greater for it. It may be said, I will repent and pray for the pardon of my sin before I do it. I answer, what a delusion of Satan you are under. I have read indeed of a philosopher who called upon his gods and so threw himself into the fire to his own destruction. But do you think that God will hear such a prayer? No. Psalms chapter 66 verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you come before God with murderous plans in your heart, God will not accept your prayers. He says, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15, When you make many prayers, I will not hear you, your hands are full of blood. Nor can this be called true repentance. For a man to confess a sin and be resolved still upon the commission of it? No, 
It is he who confesses and forsakes his sin that will find mercy. Application 2 Here it is evil to speak favorably either of self-murder or of those who have self-murdered. There have been those who have attempted to justify self-murder in some cases. Pagan philosophers taught that it was lawful for persons to murder themselves, that they might save their reputation or prevent falling into the hands of their enemies. In what we call the second book of the Maccabees, we find celebrated an action of one racist, for which the Jews lift him up as a martyr. But Austin censures him for a criminal self-murderer with reasons that cannot be answered. To praise the person who commits self-murder to heaven is an evil and a dangerous practice. We should rather leave secret things for God and for the discoveries of the great day, because we do not know that he might be at that time under some illness, and it is not impossible that God may have suffered Satan to possess and torment and kill the bodies of some whose souls may yet still be saved in the day of the Lord. Yet on the other hand, if there were no signs of madness appearing before they went to destroy themselves, nor any evidence of repentance after such attempts were underway, we should not say such persons have gone to heaven. For by being overly charitable to the dead, we have become cruel to the living. The saying, such persons are saved, may occasion and encourage others to follow them. And the everlasting destruction of bodies and souls could be caused by this attempt to praise the dead. Application 3 Beware this sin. One might think there is no great need for such an application, to call upon men to do themselves no harm, since there is in every man a principle of self-preservation usually at work. Yet there are too many opportunities for it. One self-murder makes way for another. Saul's self-murder led to the same for his armor-bearer. It is a sad thing in a place of so much light and praise as this church, it needs to be said that self-murder is of the devil, that in such a place there should be any need of insisting on such a subject to the saints. Yet there have been self-murderers in the church, and there are those tempted with it now. A little over four years ago, I saw I had to insist on this important subject because within the space of only five weeks, there had been five self-murders. The Lord knows how many others may be tempted at this time to do the same. I am not without some fear that the bloody lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour may be let loose among this flock. And so I thought it my duty to stand against him with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, not knowing but that I may help rescue poor creatures out of his hands. My advice on the occasion is this. First, be humbled in the sight of God. Be humbled for all your sins, and be humbled under temptations to this sin. Be humbled as long as you have a day to live. Because they who have not been humbled, Satan has been let loose upon them with great violence. When a sin has been repented of, there will not be as much danger of that sin as there was before. Secondly, Beware of such sins as may provoke the holy and righteous God to leave you into the most horrid evil. Beware of pride, when men will rather not exist than be what God would have them to be. What a cursed form of pride is that! This produces grumblings at the providence of God and causes people to say, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 33, Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Beware of self-confidence. Be sensible of your weakness. Let him that stands take heed, for he may fall. Do not be confident of your own strength to encounter the adversary. If God should let Satan loose upon you, he'll be too hard for you to overcome. Beware of a heart glued to this world. When the world is a man's idol, he will rather part with his very life, and with his own hands he'll take it away, than part with the world. Beware of unbelief. Do not distrust the fatherly care of the Heavenly Father. Beware of despair. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. Putting on a helmet, the hope of salvation. Do not say, the day of grace is over with me. Do not say, I have sinned unpardonably. These are the imaginations of vanity. 
Beware of the more hideous crimes and sins, those which are in a special manner of God-provoking evils. The sins against nature are some of these. Some have been guilty of such sins in secret and have not repented of them. Those who fell to dark and evil sins were then tempted to sin even further against nature by committing self-murder. There are other atrocious crimes where the sin of self-murder has been the consequence. Judas and Pilate are two fearful examples of it. Finally, beware of backsliding from God and from good beginnings in the faith. Remember that word, Hosea chapter 8, verse 3. He cast off the thing that is good, the enemy will pursue him. Some have left off prayer in their families and have left off their attendance of theological training and left off godly exercises which they used to do. Therefore, the enemy of their souls is let loose upon them and he tempts them to self-destruction. Thirdly, resist the tempter. It is the counsel, James chapter 4, verse 7. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do you resist him? Do it by crying to God. If the avenger pursues you, fly to Christ as the city of refuge. Resist the devil. The next words are, draw near to God. But then, employ the word of God for the resisting of the temptation. It was Luther's method. Yes, our Jesus has given us a pattern of it. It is written. Do one thing more. Confess the temptations of the devil. Make a confession, not foolishly into all the world, but to some faithful minister or to some other able Christian, one that cut his own throat a while ago, said before his death, Oh, that I had told someone how I was tempted. If I had, I believe I should never have come to this. Fourth, Above all, a true faith is to be worked after. By faith, embrace an offered Savior. This will keep you from the destroyer. Being by faith, safe in the hands of your Savior. The devil will not pluck you out of those hands. It is directed, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, take the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, as by faith we obtain a victory over the world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. So we obtain a victory over Satan too. He has not such a power over a true believer as he has over others. Act faithfully on the victory of your Savior over Satan, hoping and looking for a share in that. And by faith, look up to your Savior as looking to one who knows how to save the tempted. I uh, don't really have a whole lot to add to what Increase said here in the sermon itself, but I will say, as someone who works with uh, students and with people who are a little bit younger, this is a subject that I do get asked about quite uh, quite a bit, actually. You would be surprised how many times uh, people ask, you know, what what is it that we are supposed to think of this subject of, you know, self-murder, as Increase made their product, you know, suicide is how we say it today, but what do we think of taking one's own life? And so I would really recommend that if you know some young people, if you have uh, people in your life, especially who are younger, not, not that they have to be, but just be keeping an eye on the people around you and, you know, be speaking this truth into their life that it, it can be easy for people to get overwhelmed or think that they are on a road where there's no hope or there is a lot of people who can be struggling with moments of circumstantial overwhelmingness and they can be asking questions about this and if they don't know who is somebody I can go to or where can I find that? This can be a real problem. Let the church be, if you are, especially if you're in ministry or a pastor or someone like that, let's let the church be the place where they can find their answer and they can find people who tell them, hey, you know, this is not the best answer for you. And if you are, you know, if you are in ministry, you are a pastor, make sure that this is a subject that you cover, especially if you're working with younger people, because it is a question that they are asking. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by John Rayner. John Rayner is a professional voiceover artist and a 2021 Marconi Radio Award finalist. You can find out more at johnraynard.com. 
If you enjoyed this episode, at the very beginning of it, we did, uh, at, you know, read a YouTube comment. If you have not given us a comment or left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or somewhere like that, we would love to hear from you. As of right now, as I go over to Revive Thoughts on Apple Podcasts, we currently have a 5.0 rating out of 162 Yay. ratings, and many of them are written. This is absolutely incredible that we have such a good rating with so many re- uh, so many people rating it too. We really appreciate all of you who have left us ratings and left us reviews and we encourage you to continue doing so. It's just uh, been a blessing to see people just reacting and enjoying what we do here at Revive Thoughts. This is Troy and Joel and this is Revive Thoughts. With any dream, the wind won't always be at your back, the sun won't always be shining, and some rain is going to fall. American Family Insurance is like a good solid roof that you can trust to protect your biggest dreams. With plans that could save you up to 23% when you bundle your home and auto. Also, you can continue to dream fearlessly, no matter what comes your way. American Family Insurance. Get a quote or find an agent at AmFam.com. Visit AmFam.com to learn how discounts may apply to you. American Family Mutual Insurance Company assigned its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. Welcome to BreezeLine, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile. Our home internet is just plain better, more reliable and faster because we put internet first. If there's network congestion, we won't slow your internet down like T-Mobile does to help their cell customers. And right now, you can try out a true internet experience with BreezeLine's reliable and fast fiber-powered home internet. Find your perfect speed with prices starting at $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to BreezeLine.com to learn more.